nice new brother WP1 word processor. I could connect the Raspberry Pi up to the UART. I am actually going to take the time to write a whole new terminal emulator. Yeah, uh, what this is doing is it's drawing a few, it's updating a few rows. Then a character comes in, so it stops redrawing. The character is processed through the state machine. This causes uh, the screen to scroll, which dirties everything. Therefore, when it does the redraw, it starts again at the top of the screen. It's just not a very nice user experience. But we can do that by adding another ring buffer. What we're going to do here is we're going to use the same kind of ring buffer that we've got here for the keyboard, but for the interface as well. We have enormous amounts of RAM available. We really don't need to worry about doing this efficiently, so this should be easy. What this will do is it will allow us, if I can find the display code again, Inside the flush code, here, if we see that the interface is readable, we can read a byte and stash it in the ring buffer and then continue drawing. That should hopefully be pretty cheap, only a handful of instructions. That way, when we finish redrawing and going back to the main loop, we will then uh, process all the keys in the ring buffer in one go so that it should be ready the, the screen should be ready to be displayed again in the next frame the danger is that if we receive more than 256 characters from the interface while redrawing the ring buffer will fill up but I think that's very unlikely and uh, we can probably work around it anyway. So, uh, where was I? Right, I added a I add the parameters for the interface's buffer and we're going to add uh, int push and int pull. What are we going to do if there isn't anything uh, we will return a flag so here in the keyboard stuff this is the pull code, so we can just copy this completely. Um, the keyboard code, yeah, that returns it. Right, so if the buffer is empty, uh, we don't need to set that anymore. If the buffer is empty, then we return with Z set, which means allows the caller to detect this. Otherwise, we read a byte into C and return it. Uh, we want to... So the keyboard code, it returns zero if there's nothing to read. In this code, we want to avoid treating zero specially in order to make this, insert double quotes here, 8-bit uh, clean. I 
can't imagine that we'll ever actually want to receive zeros or from the interface and do anything with them but let's at least make the effort to do this correctly and keyboard push push the key onto the king buffer into the yeah, on into the keyboard buffer keyboard type does it we should rename that but anyway so interface push uh, okay so let's export these and push and pull sort right and in our main routine we are going to wait a minute this reads a byte from the interface and it returns zero if there's no byte pending. Mm. So this returns NZ. So because that's that's the result of this comparison be rather nice if we could return Z which is what we're using th throughout for errors how do I invert the Z flag well the obvious thing is that. Uh, this is the error path, so this shouldn't happen very often, and if there's no byte pending, then we've got nothing to do anyway. So, uh, Actually, it might from the interface and push it into the ring buffer. Okay, so this is just going to fall through into the int push code. So here in main, all we're going to do is this. That, that will make sure that if there are any bytes in the interface they get read and put onto the ring buffer. So now we want to call int pull and if Z is clear, call like this. And I forgot that you can do conditional calls. So this is actually, no, we can't use it here because we need to make two calls in a row. Cool. Okay, so we should now have our code working again via the ring buffer. Um, 
Let me just look to see if I need to initialize the ring buffer. I do not. Zeros is correct. So we go to the display code. And what we're going to do is uh, use the same logic we previously had. And a conditional call so that if we're readable, call key pending, which will save the registers we care about, which is BC and call. like that. Uh, do we care about any other parameters? I do not believe we do. BC is the only one we're interested in, so we only have to push BC. Yeah, that should work. Okay, it does not actually uh, build because we need to import int pull. And then the display code Int read. Okay. Um, and in fact, because we have so much memory available, I am just going to do a thing. I'm going to get rid of add AHL and add ADE and inline things instead. So. So this is the most efficient way to do it by code size. But instead, we are going to This will allow us to construct and inline the add, the add whatever, add A to whichever 16-bit register we want. Uh, this is going to be one, two, that's not right. Ray, that should be. One, two, three, four, five bytes. Uh, but previously, each call to add AHL would have been three bytes. So this was two bytes longer, but considerably faster as we don't have the overhead of call and ret, both of which hit memory and are therefore quite slow. So in interface 
what we're going to do is to add a 16h comma rail. Or maybe we're not. Uh, backslash introduces a macro parameter, wasn't it? Uh, where did I put some macro? Oh yeah, in the display code. Ah, I didn't use any parameters. At least I know the question mark contact uh, syntax is correct. What does this do? That doesn't work either. Okay. Um, Each occurrence of the former parameter pk replaced by the corresponding value vk. So I don't think I need to provide any specific syntax for this. So why doesn't it like it? Reg low, reg high, question mark L1. Well, I think I'm doing it right. So this would be add a 16H camarel again. It seems to have inserted a new line where there shouldn't be one. Uh, no, no, it's worked. Right, I was looking at the error from the previous iteration through. All right, so let's actually take out these. So we should get lots of errors. Uh, we can't export these anymore. We have add AHLs everywhere. There's one here, 16 HRL. A16H, L. Unfortunately, I don't think... Yeah, I have to have the parameter in A in order to add it. So... Um, I can't dispense with this move here. Uh, 
add a 16H Comorel. Okay, you've got something in keyboard Z80. And we've got some in uh, uh -huh. okay, and we've got some in VT one oh two. Add a sixteen inch Camarel. Here's one here. Just the two. Right. Um because our add A16 has got a label in it, this means that it, the state of automatic dot labels here has been reset. So, can we create one I don't think we can however I think we can do this I need to check the listing to make sure that that's produced the, the right code. Uh, dollar should refer to the current uh, the current program counter address, but I can never remember whether it's the address of the next instruction or this one. I think that's this one actually, so that would make that plus three. So um, there's plenty of them in display. Right, so this is where the macro is defined. Here is his, here is where it is used. Uh, yes, I believe that has worked. Yeah, it's jumping to address address hex 23 which is 3 plus the current address the offset encoded into the instruction is 1 which is correct because this offset is applied after the instruction has been read so it's skipping one instruction which is this one all right now we also wanted to fix the delete key which was driving me nuts and i think i know what's that is doing which is this routine here for inserting blank characters now I think that what this is doing is, is, is that it's advancing the cursor one for each space printed and I don't think it should be doing that I think it should be uh, leaving the cursor where it is. So how to do this? Well, the obvious thing is just save the cursor and restore it again afterwards. Um, what does the documentation say? Uh, oh, oh, no, it's an insert operation. 
doesn't print blank characters, it inserts them, so thus editing the line that's already present. Right, now, uh, we can't do this without adding a backend primitive to do it, because the state machine doesn't have access to the screen data. That is, in order to insert a character, we have to change the entire line, which cannot be done with the set of primitives we've got, which is uh, not there, they are here. The insert line, clear line, delete line, and print. That's all we have. So, yep, what I want to do, in fact, is remove this completely uh, and change the term info file not to support it. That is not, tell the term info file that we don't support it and it shouldn't try to use that. It should be relatively straightforward. Uh, is there anything else I wanted to do? I don't think so. I think that's the lot. Okay, how big is our program? This is the hex dump. Here you can see the repeated code for our uh, draw routine. Got some tables, more code, more tables. Here is the end of the code, and then it's all zeros from there on up. Uh, COO here is our limit. So we can use code, we can have another, let me see, this page is empty, this page is about half full, so that's 256 plus 128, which is 384 bytes. We've got that much to spare. In fact, we also have the entire second track, which we can put stuff into. But I'd have to update the boot code to load that as well. And honestly, that's kind of full, so I'd rather not. Anyway, this should be fine. There's plenty of space. Uh, RAM, of course, isn't going to be in this table. So let me just double check. Yeah, I do have a DSEG there. And there. Uh, this is displaying all the segments. P is for programs. D is for data. Uh, or the data appears after the program starting at 7A70. This is the size. So display is big because it's got the, the back buffer in it. Interface is big because it's got our new interface buffer in it. Keyboard is big because it's got the new keyboard bu buffer in it. And VT102 is quite small. I thought I had more state than that. Oh no, just this. Oh, all right. I will write that to disk and let's give it a try. Hmm. Yes, uh, I think it's fair to say that this is not working. Well, this isn't going to help. Well, I found the stupid bug that was causing the garbage on the screen, but now nothing does anything. So, uh, yeah. Um, and if I use the Raspberry Pi to send serial to the, well, serial port, again, nothing happens. Um, I believe that we are sending bytes. Um, I will just double check this by... Uh, oh, yeah, we are. 
sorry, I'm just looking at the output on the uh, from the Raspberry Pi's own monitor. So we haven't broken the keyboard to the outside world bit. We've only broken the outside world to the interface to the brother bit. So um, I'll go and try and figure out what's going on there. I think. Well, I fixed the stupid bug, which was a typo, of course. It's always a typo. I'd managed to invert a flag and a branch somewhere, so it was failing to report correctly the byte's been read from the interface. And it does seem to work. And scrolling is reasonably fast. There is snow at the top of the screen, which is annoying, because that means I'll have to reduce the number of scan lines drawn per frame. And that's okay. Uh, it does... Yeah, the delete is still broken, of course. I haven't done anything about that. Uh, I haven't done anything to the term info file yet. Um, scrolling looks a bit weird. Unfortunately, you can see by the number of dropouts, which that's where the rainbow appears, that my HDMI capture is increasingly less happy with the uh, the output from the OSSC. It might be overheating. Hmm. Um, anyway, uh, if I do things like clear the screen, we don't get a complete prompt, which means that characters are being lost, which is annoying. It's because clearing the screen involves updating quite a lot of memory, therefore it is a fairly slow procedure. Now, um, unfortunately, I did come up with a really cool way to enable hardware flow control in the interface. Uh, that's not the unfortunate bit. The unfortunate bit is that enabling hardware flow control on the Raspberry Pi turns out to be really complicated, involving doing stuff like device trees. Uh, there is software flow control where we can send back a byte saying don't send any more data and then go away and do stuff and then send another byte saying send data again but I don't think that would help here. So I think we just need to make things faster. So we spend less time doing things to the screen. Clear screen is a clear time sink because that doesn't work. So we can certainly speed that up. Uh, right now it's being implemented as lots of clear L calls. We can certainly put in a primitive to actually clear the screen and make it optional. Uh, that's what the CPM-ish TTY driver does. Um, it may be possible to speed up the brother to the interface communication using that cool trick I thought of, uh, but that's only going to save a handful of bytes per operation, so I think clear screen is the way to go. Because everything else seems to work apart from that well apart from the the beep uh, let's just try so if you set term to VT 102 oops and man so here's the man page scrolling through see there is something wrong at the bottom of the screen so let us do I have, yeah, so this is kind of garbage, but uh, infocomp is the program that decompiles term info uh, files. So, whoops, if I do this, that is going to produce, I forgot to set the rows and columns, rows 14, columns 91. So this is the term info file that describes the uh, 
that describes the terminal we're currently using, which ooh, is clearly wrong. I thought it was working better than that, actually. And I'm not sure how much it's coming through, but peering at the phone screen, I can't read this text at all. Oh, no, no, I can actually just about make sense of it. But uh, I was going to try and edit this online, but I'm not going to. I'm going to sort this out after the facts and tell you what happened. Uh, anyway, let's see what we can do about clear screen. It's working now, so it's clearly marginal. So what we're going to do to speed up things like arrays all is add a option. So we say if emulate clear screen, then uh, we do all of this code. If we do not, then we are going to define do ed all to be the external const constant or the external routine uh, dpy clear screen. So when we build that, that of course fails because we haven't defined emulate clear screen which we're going to put into constants. So emulate clear screen is zero, meaning do not. Uh, we now need to import dpy clear screen. Uh, oh, right. We can't use equals for there. We have to use EQU. Can we? Can we actually do that? Also, it turns out that the routine we're using to do it is uh, being used by other things. So let's just shunt this out here. So that it, that's still a fall through, but it could be not. Yeah, I could have sworn that you could do that, but apparently you can't. So we're going to have to be cleverer. So if emulate clear screen, call that otherwise call dpy clear screen. If emulate clear screen, call that, otherwise call dpy clear screen. So then this just becomes a end if. This goes away and it compiles, apart from, you know, not having a DPY clear screen. So we're going to put that in here. DPY clear screen. So what we're going to do is uh, set all the dirty bits. So that will be 
Dirty Buffer. Dirty Buffer plus one. Uh, screen height minus one. Like that. And the screen itself. Back buffer plus one. Initialize it with a space and fill. Okay, so that should be way faster than what we've currently got but we can still improve this. This is a big enough chunk of stuff to clear that we can probably use the, the DMA engine for it. Uh, but this should do for now. Uh, Okay, however, now I think about it, I think I'm doing this wrong. I don't think I want to um, emulate this. I want to emulate this because this is used by uh, arrays start to cursor and cursor to end. Of course, if you erase cursor to end when the cursor is homed in the top left corner, then that's actually going to do a lot of work. So let's back out all the stuff we did by repeatedly pressing the U key. Okay. Let's go to constants. Emulate clear lines. No, let's call that clear A for clear area. So if emulate DPY clear area call our emulated routine, otherwise call dpy clear area. Do the same there. And do the same here. So if emulate dpy clear area equals zero. Oh, wait, if it's one, then we use our emulation routine. Okay, so dpy clear area, go here, uh, dpy clear a, End of screen. Okay. Here's rows D to E, D inclusive to E exclusive. So, first thing we're going to do is
we're going to keep our DPY clear S routine because this is a really fast way to clear the whole screen which is going to be the common case. So what we do is are we clearing the entire screen? If so, uh, use optimized routine. Otherwise, we want to clear only this area. So how are we going to do this? Set 30 bits. So D is the, let me double check this, uh, arrays. Yeah, E is, E is exclusive, D is inclusive. So this is right. So Okay, uh, the number of lines we want to erase are like that. Put this into B. We now want to copy uh, the dirty bit address into DE and increment it. and go. Is this worth it? That's quite a lot of code. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen bytes, and there's only fourteen possible rows. So I think this is better done the old fashioned way. So that is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven bytes per iteration. This is 13 bytes plus two each iteration. Yeah, let's go with the simple code.
Now, this, however, we are going to want to use LDIR for. So first we have to calculate the addresses. So... Okay, now we want to do the same. For E, get the, the last line. However, I do want to be sure that if somebody asks for, because the, the end range is exclusive, somebody might ask for line 14. Therefore, this table here must have 15 lines in it, the last entry of which points to one past the end of uh, the back buffer. Um, we can't put that into DE because we will overwrite what we've got there. And I actually think we want to do this the other way around. So we have to put this into BC because then we have no other registers available. And we can now put that into DE. Hmm. We're not actually going to need the, the row data after this. So in fact, we can do this. This swaps HL and DE, which means that we now have our address in DE and our range in HL. So the first row is going to be, is now in H. So this gives us the first row in HL here and the last row in DE. So we swap again and then we subtract.
and we then put it in BC. Okay, uh, now our we, however, we have just lost last plus one because that was in HL, but we don't need it anymore. All we need is first, which is still in DE. So, This then allows us to do this. Everything is set up for our copy and we can do LDIR. That is more code than I really want, but uh, hopefully it'll work. Uh, right, SBC and we want to clear the carry. Nope, that is the, uh, that's the 6.02 version. Now I just had th this same question a little while back. So, here we go, CCF. Let's have a quick code size check. Uh, that lot didn't compile into terribly much code. This is all pretty efficient too, actually. Nearly all of these instructions are one byte. Uh, we're looking for clear A, which is here. So here's where we do the dirty bit stuff. Right, here's our arithmetic. And yeah, most of this is, well, SBC is a two byte extended instruction. Yep. Okay, I am going to write that and see what it does. And the answer is, it crashes the system. <laughs> you know what I forgot to do? I forgot to actually add on the two values to the back buffer address table. Oh dear. Well, I found out why uh, control G that is generating a beep was producing garbage and pros probably the reason for a lot of other garbage, which is, remember this optimization I did where I was using deck rather than actual comparisons? Doesn't work. I mean, the deck bit's fine, but stuff like this is not fine. Uh, beep is a seven, and of course, if a is 7 and we subtract 8 then we get a minus 1 or an FF which means it's going to fall all the way through here and hit print, print printables so this test here for characters less than 32 isn't gonna work so yeah I'm just gonna take the whole thing out and replace it with old-fashioned compares it's slower and it's longer but it's much more likely to work. So this should be compared with 27, and this should be 
compare with 32. So this will probably improve things a lot. I captured what it was doing when I tried pressing delete. And it is indeed doing a CSI, it's doing a backspace, and then a CSI K, which is here, with no parameter. So that will end up being a zero. So that's doing a do CSI EL cursor to end. So what's wrong with cursor to end? Looks okay to me. So what this is doing is it's erasing everything below the cursor and then doing this. So I wonder if that seems more likely to be wrong because this is going to be implemented by printing spaces. So this is actually printing spaces. Why on earth did I decide to do it like that? Probably because I hadn't come up with the new semantics for DPY Prune. Okay, we can simplify this lots. So this is supposed to clear from the current cursor position to the end of the line. So we load the current cursor position we then are going to do a loop see what let's yeah we need to load the current cursor position into de now we're going to do a loop where we print a space and then see if we're at the end of the line we probably want to do the test first. Yes, yeah, so let's do the test first. So can I just do a ret z there? Do I need to dirty the row? El cursor to end. Yes, I do need to dirty the row. But that can happen here. And that takes the cursor position in uh No it doesn't. Because I'm getting my VT state machine mixed up with my display. This stuff doesn't have to pay any attention to the row dirtying. Okay, so all we need to do is we want to save A and DE. So push AF, push DE load C with the character we want to print print A pop DE pop AF ink A jump back to dot one so that's smaller and simpler code and we are going to do exactly the same thing for this one so this is slightly different yeah so a is going to be mm, you see with this 
we're comparing against a constant. Here, we're actually comparing against E, therefore we need a E E. We're comparing against E, which contains the current cursor position. So we need another register to put it in. Can we use A? I think we could. So compare with E, return if equal. Otherwise, push AF, push DE, call DPY, print A. Pop DE, pop AF. Ink AJR.1. Yeah, that should work better. I've also noticed that our uh, insole and del don't seem to be working right. So let's don't recall changing this code recently, to be honest. So, it's possible it's trying to do something else. These are both pretty straightforward. Okay, I'll try th this as is. Well, there were some stupid typos to fix, but if I type and then I press the delete key, it deletes, which is nice. Let's try command as I control U. Fantastic. Okay, so what does nano do? Well, that looks like garbage. See, this is It is scrolling a section of the screen, but I think what it's doing, well, of course, it has to be doing is uh, redrawing the, that entire section of the screen, which isn't particularly optimal. But as I told it that we don't have scrolling windows, that's the only way it has to do it. That looks like it's working. Oh yes, I forgot to say, I did a term cap file. So if I turn that off, which is this? Let's try that again in less. Uh, that fast scrolling was not really what I wanted. Uh, but... Hmm... I can't seem to go up and down either. It's not right. Uh, this is the a copy of the VT102, and that's definitely wrong. A copy of the VT102 term cap file, term info file. Uh, but I took out the stuff that our terminal doesn't know anything about. But it's clearly still not right but it's getting there. I fixed a whole pile of term cap bugs and now VI works. In fact, most things work also, although there is still some screen corruption. Now, what's interesting is if you scroll down, it works fine. Scroll up, and that happens. So yes, something is very clearly wrong in the scroll up code. So that is a good place to look for more bugs. The problems with scrolling up are clearly due to insert line here, which I think is, you guessed it, another stupid typo. So looking at this, LDDR copies from the location of HL to the location of DE, and the way we've set this up is that HL is pointing at the last line of the screen and DE is pointing at the second last line of the screen. So this is actually 
going to copy from the last line to the second last line. In other words, it's trying to scroll up rather than down. So I think that these two are the wrong way round, and that should be like that. And, as you can see, it now seems to be working, which is great. Unfortunately, uh, it's still not quite right. I mean, you can see, like, it appears not to have been clearing the entire line, which is wrong. So, oh, no, no, that's not quite right. I mean, that does seem to be the problem. If I do Control L to force it to redraw everything, you'll see what's different. Let's try that again. Scroll down to the bottom and go up. Yeah, I don't think it's blanking the last line. Uh, the other thing is if we try to scroll down, that is also quite wrong. Luckily, the scroll down issue seems to be fairly straightforward. Which is this code here. So scrolling up means that deleting the top line so that all the text then moves up one. Scrolling down means not deleting the last line, but inserting the first line. So that should be fairly easy to fix. Now both of these, however, seemed to be failing to blank the last line, which is this code here. Uh, that looks straightforward. So it's the back buffer. It's the we set HL to be the address of the last line of the screen. D to be D to be one plus that. Yeah, that should be fine, unless I wonder if ZMac does precedence properly. O four nine F O four A zero. No, that is correct code. So is this calculation wrong? That's line screen height minus one is thirteen. Yeah, this should be fine. So why isn't it updating? I mean, it's not a problem with dirtying the the row. Why am I doing it like that? That's a slow way. Just load. Uh, you can do it like that. That's much better. So you see this is three, four, five bytes, and doing it like this is one, two, three, four, five bytes, which is therefore clearly better in every way. In fact, it saves a few cycles. Last line. There we go. So why does it not seem to be blanking the last line? Up here we're loading HL with back buffer end minus screen width. That should be the same value as this, which we know is 049F. 049F. 
Yeah, there should be nothing at all controversial here. Oh, I'm an idiot. Of course, uh, blank last line is correct for deleting the first line of the screen because everything scrolls up and the last line ends up blank. Inserting will need to blank the uh, the current line. So this is wrong. In fact, I don't know what is blanking, but it's the wrong thing. So, uh, we are going to want to save the line address that we calculate here. Let's just stash, stash that on the stack. We've run out of registers. So unless we use the alternate register set, which we could, but it's annoying. Yeah, it would be too hard to do. Well, it wouldn't be worthwhile. The thing about the alternate register set is that it swaps HL, DE, and BC with these which is great if you want three registers that you can use without corrupting anything else but copying from one to the other is ghastly you either have to go through the stack by doing a push, a EXX and a pop or you have to do it piecemeal through A which is even worse anyway we push the line address into HL, we pop it back uh, And then we are going to clear line in HL. Clear like this. So scrolling down works just fine. As you can see. Scrolling up is a bit more problematic. So the fact that we're getting uh, partial command codes suggests to me that we're leaving it in the leaving things in the wrong state. So the state machine is expecting, or rather, the program is expecting the state machine to be in waiting for character, and it's not. It's in something else. So it receives the X, the escape, doesn't know what to do with it, drops out of whatever state it was in, and then prints the rest of the command code as letters. This is almost certainly because one of our insert or delete line commands has forgotten to call set state waiting. And that's going to be this one. So these three are all executed from within the escape state that's not CSI state that's just received an escape and they go uh, to here which just does the thing and calls update cursor so let's just change those we're also going to rename these to something other, something that doesn't have a TTY prefix. So that will be call set state waiting. And we want one here. TTY reverse line feed uh, to do reverse line feed uh, we don't want one here because do line feed will do it for us TTY new line to do new line uh, now TTY carriage return wait a minute wait a minute These all terminate through update cursor. 
we only update the cursor at the end of a command. Ah, uh, but if we bail out without calling update cursor like we do here. Oh, hang on, hang on. That's called set state waiting there. I think we can simplify this. So we do want to rename those things, but let's not call set state waiting here. And we're going to rename TTY carriage return to do carriage return because uh, symbols starting TTY are exposed to the outside world. Uh, well, these are exposed to the outside world, but we also want to reserve that prefix as well, just to avoid confusion. So, uh, so TTY set X can become just set X. TTY set Y can just become set Y. Okay, and these TTY cursor X can become cursor X. TTY cursor Y can become cursor Y. Uh, command flags is just command flags. Current param is just current param, and TTY parameters is just parameters. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, escape state. No, this has called set state waiting. Uh, maybe it's happening in CSI? No, we've called set state waiting here. That's weird. So, um, I was sure that was what the problem was. So where are the places that, say, do line feed can be called from? Just make sure that compiles. You said, yeah. Yes, that does compile. Okay, do line feed happens from inside print ASCII, and we have called set state waiting. Advance cursor happens from print printable, and we won't get here at all unless we are in set state in in state waiting. Escape state waiting. New line. Where do we call new line? Yep. Yep. You're only two places. In fact, we know from trying the program that it only seems to do this when scrolling up, which will happen through. Uh, well, it's called scroll down, because that's the way the text moves, which will happen through here. So where is do reverse line feed coming from? Here, we're in waiting. Those are the only places. Okay, so what about scroll down? 
reverse line feed here so maybe it's using one of the other entry points to insole for example this one that is the only one there is we're calling in our DPY insole from here and from scroll down and nowhere else so do CSI ill happens from CSI non private and we have call set state waiting we are in the waiting state here so we must be in the right state okay maybe it's something else maybe we're spending so much time doing that insert that we are dropping a byte and that byte would be escape because we're in the printing state without that escape it's then printing the characters remaining I think that is very likely and we can check for that by commenting out she won't do it here we'll do it here by finding the insole routine which is here and we are going to skip the bit that does the work so if this is a state machine issue we will still see the garbage printed on the screen if this is a timing issue then we will not see the garbage written on the screen all right let's see where this happens we're at the bottom of the screen so we scroll up uh, and what do we get garbage huh I was honestly not expecting that. I thought we were going to get nothing and there was a timing issue. That's not what I was expecting and I am now slightly at a loss. So what you're looking at here is a hex dump of VI doing its scroll up. And here, this these three bytes, you can see where the cursor is flashing, is a CSI L sequence, which is insert lines. So this is doing something wrong. It's got it's somehow in the wrong state when it processes the, the escape following resulting in this position code being printed so we know this is going through CSI L with no parameters so here is the CSI IL code and it's really simple we load A with our parameter, uh, set flags. If it is non-zero, do nothing, otherwise increment it. In fact, thinking about it, I can probably uh, improve that to this. So this will subtract one. If the value was zero and only then, it will set the carry flag this will add on the carry so that would be four bytes and this is one two three four bytes oh well anyway we do this we shunt it into a and then we call insole the specified number of times which in this case 
should be want. Uh, and DJ NZ makes it happen B times. So that there's there's nothing particularly wrong there. It's the same code we're using in lots of other places. So what's wrong here? Well, to get to CSI non-private, we have to have gone through here, do we? Yes, this is defined in exactly one place. So we must have come through here. We're in the right state, so we just plain a just plain return will deal with it. Hey, look what's happened. I can scroll up and I can scroll down. What I did was I went into the interface firmware and I increased the serial buffer size from 8 bytes to 256 bytes. And now we have a big buffer on the interface which is uh, storing up bytes while the brother is busy. This kind of makes the entire ring buffer we put into the interface code on the brother useless because the brother is now doing it all for us. So, great. And I have a bit of a suspicion that we might be able to do something similar with the output. But anyway, this is now looking like it's working. There's still a few minor glitches, but most things are all right. So let's, uh, so nano works. Uh, you can see that there's some overwriting problems here. Uh, this could be my tab code, not printing spaces but I thought I had just fixed that actually. Scrolling is not brilliantly fast in Nano. This is because Nano does its scrolling by redrawing the screen. So that's quite a lot of serial transactions. If we do the same thing in VI, uh, I'm just trying to find a decently big file. Hang on, I can make one. So we can then scroll down and it's nice and fast because uh, this is scrolling the entire screen using a single primitive and only redrawing one line. It still can't quite keep up with the keyboard repeat key, which is a little irritating. And we still get that snow and the redraws are occasionally a bit glitched. But this looks usable. So I haven't tried this one yet. Let's try Word Grinder. Word Grinder is a cursors program. And that looks plausible. Mm, not bad, not bad. Uh, you notice that the this bar down the bottom takes more time to draw than the rest of it. That's because it's Unicode, so each one of those characters is being transmitted as three bytes. Okay, let's try menu. Yeah, that's a menu. It should be a nice box, but you know that that's more Unicode. File, open. Uh, yes, I do want you to discard uh, <laughs> there's enough space on the screen for two, no, three lines of file browser, which is working. And scroll up and down. So let's find the README. And again, the, 
the keyboard auto repeat is far faster than the uh, ability of the terminal to keep up. And scrolling up does a few weird things. These eyes look wrong. It does occasionally fail to print the first character of lines. But that's kind of working. I could probably almost use this. Okay, um, I think I'm going to call this relatively complete. I mean, there's more little bugs to fix, but I don't think I'm going to do those on video because it's just not very interesting. I do wish I had hardware flow control because then I could crank the board rate all the way up to 115 kiloboard and we would get redraws as fast as physically possible that will transfer data to the brother faster than the brother can draw it. Uh, but that's not safe without it. Now, I have figured out how to turn hardware flow control on on the Raspberry Pi, uh, but I'd need to rework the interface to get enough space on the FPGA to fit the UART because we can't use the built-in UART with flow control on this. You have to build your own out of logic. So I might do some exploring there. Also, the one thing I haven't done anything about, well, you can see here, it, uh, is italicized, underlined, and bold text, and of course, reverse text. To make that work, we need to start working with the attribute area of the video memory. This is like easy conceptually, it's just another set of video memory that contains the bits per character, and there are eight bits that do different things. And I know that the Brother controller has got quite a lot of different uh, attribute bits you can use. However, this of course will double the amount of video memory that we need to update each frame. And there's already a little snow at the top of the screen when scrolling. So really, it's currently set to seven lines of update per frame. We would need to switch that to six. And of course, doubling the amount of memory that gets updated switches it to three which is not a lot. So I'm wondering what I can do about that. I do have a few plans. I think I am going to do some experimenting to figure out what it is that's worth doing with these various things. And then I will come back and report so there's probably going to be more of a gap than usual until the next video as I figure this stuff out. And then I'll do a summary. Anyway, until then. <laughs>